conclude my talk about worship. And uh, one of the ways, one of the, one part of the nature of worship is about worship with service. Uh, the, in the book of Romans chapter 12, the Bible says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What we have been trying to do is to figure what worship is about and, uh, and how meaningful it is for us, the children of God. And I'm going to encourage you to really pay attention today because uh, <clears throat> we're going to figure the meaning of life as we go through the scriptures today. And that scripture is, uh, is taking us to a different realm when we talk about worship. We talk about worship um, you know, that we need to go beyond being satisfied with the benefit that we receive to go and prostrate before the Lord and, and bow down and yield, the, yield the, the, the reins of our destiny to our Creator and um, worship Him with our hearts, with our minds, with our soul. Praise His name. Recognize who He is. And recognize what he has done for us. Amen? And, and don't, don't let it trap there. Don't let your personality to get in the way of worship. Because that's something that I hear a lot around. And it is, well, I'm not that kind of people. So I'm not going to do that. Well, that is not the life of a disciple. A disciple is enlightened by God, is, is the truth is revealed before him, so he changes his life and starts to experience new things because he's a new creation, the reality of salvation. And today's uh, scripture on Romans 12, <clears throat> uh, we need to, we're going to talk about uh, Worship, and we're going to take the worship in the Old Testament to help us figure some things out. And the first thing that I want to talk about uh, that these scriptures is bringing to us is that worship is, an, is to bring to the altar, it is to bring to God an offering of life. Like when we talk about sacrificial offerings in the Old Testament, many times we fail to perceive the reality of the picture it represents. Blood in the sacrifices, in the offerings, scandalizes us and intimidates our senses. It looks so bloody, so messy that all that we can come up with is a reflection of a fearsome character in God. The fear is a horror because of the bloody scene, but let me explain a reality that we barely, I mean, many times we don't realize. With the blood sacrifices, that were offered, God wants to permeate our minds, our hearts, with something of a stream and ultimate importance. We are going to analyze this coming out of the Lord's words to Noah when he ordered him to repopulate, um, um, I'm sorry, 
repopulate. It's repopulate? Great, repopulate the earth. In Genesis chapter 9, go to your Bibles. I want you really to follow me here so you don't think I'm creating a crazy gospel here. Genesis chapter 9, God is talking to Noah and his sons after the flood, after the, uh, all happened and they put their feet on dry land again and they, they're going to start, restart human life on earth. On verse 3 of Genesis 9, he says, everything that lives and moves about, about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. Remember where we are. We are at the restart of life for mankind. For the existence. And God is setting the rules. God is giving Noah and his sons, which are the new administrators, like he put Adam and Eve on charge of the garden, remember? Now he's telling Noah and his children, okay, here we go. I'm trusting you guys, and incredibly, within the first words that God speaks to them is this warning about blood. And uh, I want you to focus on verse 4, the, King, the New King James Version says it better. It says, but you shall not eat flesh with its life that is its blood. In other words, the Lord is saying, life is in the blood. The blood is life. And that is the key to our analysis. When the blood of an animal was shed on the altar, the life of the animal was shed. Do you understand that? When the when, the, when you have a sacrifice, as messy as it can be because of the slaughtering of animals and all this blood, you need to understand what God is trying to say. Because when this blood is shed on the altar, the life of that offering is being shed. In other words, its greater procession is given on the altar. The greatest offering anyone could ever offer is before the Lord. This is very important that we can understand because when analyzing the sacrifices that were made, we can see how God is telling us this. If you want to thank for forgiveness of your sins with an offering, offer your life. If you want to thank for healing, offer your life. If you want to thank your communion with God, offer your life. Do you understand? It's not a big mess of hor horrible, uh, hateful God that is making all of this. No, he is teaching us. Listen. 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 
and all these institutions and all these sacrifices that you're going to be participating, that is the, the shadow of what is to come. I want you to understand that what is, what is happening here with all this blood is what I want you to understand is your relationship with me is that your life should be given to me, is that I am making you to worship me. It is that I'm making you so your life is at my disposition. If you, uh, if you go to verse 7, you're going to see that it says, as for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. And I want you to stay with me. He's saying... I'm going to, it's a serious business for me when blood is shed, he's saying, right? Do you understand that there? I did. Life is, it's blood, it's in the blood. And when blood is shed, it is life who is brought to me. And then when he tell them, tell them th those things, I'm going to be very serious about blood issues. Then he says, as for you, be fruitful and increasing number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. And see what I understand within this context? The God is saying the same thing he said to Adam and Eve. You know, multiply. But what does that multiplication mean within this context? Because Every life that comes out, is, it is a life. It is blood that comes out. It's a life. It's another offering for God. So in other words, God was saying, so fill the earth with offerings for me. Are we together here? Every child that is born is an offering for God. And for that reason, God says, I will call accountable for anyone who takes the life of somebody. Because that is my glory. Because that is what gives me worship. You consider it whatever you want to consider it, but it is life. God says, and life is what I want in my altar. So, is the greatest possession, is the greatest offering. Blood is not the, the wine of a thirsty, thirsty, uh, 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 hor horrifying God. No, no. What he's sh showing us is, listen, is your life that I want in the altar. It is your life. And everyone who is born is my offering. Watch out that you don't kill it because I'm going to hold you accountable. So there is in our text of Romans 12 a new concept then. It is living sacrifice. It is living sacrifice. When God says on verse 7, be fruitful, increase, multiply, you know, fill the earth. He's saying, fill the earth with my worship. Fill the earth with lives that will worship me. And to me, I'm understanding there that God wanted to see the earth full of offerings, but offerings are lives, 
And man is lost because he lost the meaning of life. As we do not understand that we are born to be an offering to God, we just lost the meaning of life. So, we think that life is just an uncertain accumulation of years in which our only benefit is to enjoy the work we do under the sun, like the preacher said in um, Ecclesiastes. At the end of the day, he said, that looks like something vain, an affliction of spirit. But God is telling us, no, no, no. I make you to be born to worship me. To come to my altar and give yourself to me. And, uh, and this is very much in line with what today, today's text expresses when it says that we need to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. You see how the line of thought is so coherent. We are to be living sacrifices. And that is the true and proper worship. In other words, serve God. We are born to be lives that are offerings to the Creator. We are Living sacrifices. Living sacrifices. The meaning of life is to be an offering to God. And this is your true and proper worship. I hope it's making sense with you. That it makes all the sense to me and overwhelms my senses. So God is saying, I want you to understand what I made you for. It's not exactly to the picture that looks to put you in an altar and splash your blood so it looks ugly and terrible. No, I want you to be an offering that knows what it's made for, but I want you to live. I want you to be living. But your heart is sacrificed on the altar. And so how, we do, how do we do that? Well, the text tells us about offering our bodies. Offering our bodies. How do we translate that in daily living? Offer your bodies. When Romans 6 speaks about the experience of baptism as the official ordination of a new life in Christ, makes a reference to our life of service to God. On verse 13, Romans 6 says, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. You see, God is saying, you are not an offering in the altar of sin. You are not an offering in the altar of uh, uh, evil pleasure sinful pleasure, uh, fleshy pleasures. No, that altar is not mine. Offer yourself to God as those that he has given life, as an instrument in the hands of God for righteousness. In verse 19, Repeat it. 
with the intention of helping them to chew in practical terms a reality that is human but transcends, transcends to the spiritual realm. He says on verse 19 of uh, Romans 6, I am using an example for everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. Offer your body. God says, do you want to be an offering of worship to me? An expression of worship. Come to the altar. Don't die. I want you alive. But use your body as an instrument in my hand. Do not allow your body to be the instrument of evil and deceitfulness and uh, uh, impurity. But put your body available for me, for righteousness, for holiness. As we walk and invest ourselves in serving God with our bodies, we are going to be living sacrifices. We are going to be expressions of worship that God has brought to the world for his own glory. We are capable, as we do that, we will be capable of bearing the fruit of justice and of experience holiness. You know, we struggle with that. We struggle with experiencing holiness. The world says that that's a stupidity. That is a hypocrisy of the church. But that's not what God says. God says, I want you to be holy like I'm holy. And he gives us the power to live that life. The Holy Spirit of God is within us. So worship is about offering our bodies. It's what do we dedicate our bodies to do. That is our worship to God. So when we work, that should be an expression of my worship to God. When I raise my children, that should be an expression of worship to God. When I help my neighbor, that's an expression of worship to God. When I give, when I go, especially when we work for the salvation of others, that is worship to the Most High. So, offer your body, and offering your body, you serve God. You serve God. When we go to the original word used on, on that uh, uh, scripture about our worship, our proper worship, that word... Cognate uh, implies render sacred service, sacred, sacred technical service, priestly service. And that is another struggle that we have. We are so confused about those things. In, the, in such a way that Jesus himself said in, in John chapter 6, the time is coming with anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service, a worship to God. It's the same word, the same original word. 
Also in Romans chapter 9, when it says that uh, of the people of Israel is the adoption to sonship, there, there's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, and the temple worship, the work that they did in the temple. You remember last week we talked about 24,000 people, Levites, dedicated to the service of the temple. You remember that? Isn't it that like an exaggeration of a number? When we want the service in church to be just the pastor, you know. He goes up, when he goes down, no more worship. No, 24,000. For, for music only, 4,000. Goodness. <laughs> you see the meaning of life? Do you see the meaning of your life, no matter if you work in a mine, in a cleaning business, in a food business, in a financial business? If you are the pastor of a congregation, if you are a missionary in the jungle, our lives are an expression of worship to God. And we need to understand that no matter the activity of those that we are in, on that we are to render sacred service. We are to uh, be priests. Doesn't it say that? And I think it's a, one of the letters of Peter that we are Sacred nation, holy priests for the Lord. You remember that? Ron used to be a butcher. It's difficult for us to, to put together a butcher with a priest. Well, God's intention is that both are to do it for my worship as an expression of something that is sacred. That's why when you do, uh, when you do, um, how you say, when, when you do wrong in your business, you are deserving God. When I lie as a clerk on an office, I am deserving God. I am breaking his holiness. I am trampling the sacredness of my life. That's what we need to understand when we serve God. That everything we do is sacred. Everything we do is for him. Everything we do has to reflect the life that he has put on us. That is holy, holy. So it is a work that was requested by God and must be executed in correspondence with his holy character. That's what it says on Romans 12. I urge you, brothers... And sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That is the heart of worship. Holy and pleasing to God. So if we want to be practical, we need to be different. Because verse 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That is telling me that God understands our challenge. God understands the dynamic that happened in us, this fight between the old self and the new self. The flesh and the spirit. 
God understands. God knows. And God is providing for us. But God is demanding from us. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. So by rejecting the lie and speaking the truth, we serve God. By refusing to engage in illicit activities as a way of life for money, we serve God. Not only what we refuse to do, but what we dedicate ourselves to. When we give of our time and effort so that another person is saved, we serve God. When we help the needy, the orphan, and the widow, we serve God. God is not served just by participating in a church service or giving an offering. That is fine. And it's part of worship. It's significant. It is important. But our service to God has to do with the use of our bodies, our talents, and the investment of our time in the things of the kingdom of God. Everything that we leave has to do with the kingdom of God. As you can see, our relationship with God is not frivolous, occasional, or casual. It is premeditated, it is serious, and involves commitment to our Creator and Savior. To close... Our thoughts today, I want to give you a picture of Paul's model on that. And uh, I'm, I'm going to take that out of this, the words that he said to the Philippians in chapter 1. I want you to remember that he wrote this being in prison after going through many struggles and difficulties and um, finding opposition outside and inside the church, both. Uh, but in all of these, he, not, he did not lose the notion of being a living offering for God's good pleasure. Philippians chapter 1, go with me because we're going to read a few verses and I'm not going to give too much explanations about them. I just want you to, to feel the spirit of service as a worship to God in his words. Philippians 1, 12 and on. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains, in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalt, 
exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm, I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Worship to God. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Today's scripture said, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. While we are in this world, let us be a living, sacrificial offering. That is worship. Let us pray. Father in heaven, it is clear before our eyes that we are born as an expression of your worship, that we are born to worship you, that we are born with a meaning and purpose in life of being living sacrifices, pleasing and holy to you. Father, help us to figure that out. Help us every time we see one of the sacrifices in the Old Testament not to be just captivated by a gross, bloody picture, but to understand that you're saying that what is your pleasing is to give you our lives. So forgiveness, forgive us. Forgive us when we just put ourselves in the seed of the one to be worshipped. And when we forget that you have given us the blood, that you have given us the life that is yours. I repeat the words of the psalmist on Psalm 100, and I recognize that you are God, that you created us, that we are yours, the sheep of your pasture, people of your hand. Be glorified of God with our lives. May your spirit help us. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you all.